Aikenwood family. I'm so glad that we can join together in worship and study of the word here midweek. And uh, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. Uh, you're going to be hearing from people other than me, which is always a very good thing. So first of all, we've got a song uh, that Jen is going to lead us in, and then we've got a song that Vanessa is going to lead us in, and then Randy is going to, to study the word with us together and lead us through that. And so I just encourage you to let's sing. Let's all sing together and worship together, even out loud. I know sometimes that might be kind of weird sitting in your home, uh, but I encourage you just to sing. I know the ladies that are leading us in these songs would love for you to sing with them as well, uh, because this is a time that we're, we're joining in worship, even though we can't be together in person. Uh, thank you guys for everything you do, and let's go to him now in worship. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest nights, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I'll give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. God, oh, my heart And all my life you have been so, so good. 
And every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Hey, I love you guys all, uh, Kenwood Heights. Um, I just want to say, you know, let's all hang in there, keep praying for each other, and keep remembering that, you know, God is good through everything. Thanks. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, Son, and Holy 
everybody. So glad that you could uh, join us for this midweek study as we continue through the book of Philippians. And I um, hope that today you've been able maybe to get outside and enjoy some of that sunshine and, and warmer temperatures uh, that are out today. And uh, just that you'll finish up this day with us in a, in a good way. And glad that you've decided to join us. Um, I'd ask that you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians 1. And we're going to be looking at verse 12 and following today. And I just uh, want you to join with us and have your Bibles open. And uh, let's just look at this passage together and what the Word of God has to say to us today and every day. And uh, certainly how it fits in the things that are going on even now as we endure hard times together. And, and uh, look to God uh, for the voice of uh, encouragement and support and love. Uh, that we all need, not only for ourselves, but also to share with other people. The story is told of a farmer that had grown tired of his place. Uh, it was a lot of work to keep up with, and when he looked around, he began to notice more and more things that, that needed repairs. And so he just got disgusted one day and just decided that he was going to sell his, his property and relocate. And so he contacted a realtor and, and uh, gave uh, the realtor the information that was needed to create an ad. And the next day, the realtor called him and wanted to read the ad and make sure that it met his approval. And the realtor began to read uh, the various things about the property, that it was a, an ideal location and a very spacious house, uh, extremely well-built barn and a beautiful lake and a uh, plentiful green pasture lands. And he asked the, the farmer if it sounded okay what he had read before he submitted to the newspaper. And the farmer said, could you read it again more slowly this time? And so the realtor read through the ad a second time. And when he had finished, the farmer said, don't put that ad in the newspaper. I've decided not to sell. I've been looking for a place like that all of my life. You know, a sure way to make yourself miserable is to focus on the negative. You just look for what's wrong in your house, in your car, your job, your church, your family, and you'll find it. And pretty soon you'll be unhappy and find yourself stewing and discontent over the current state of what you have. But on the other hand, if you focus on what is right in your job, what is right in your family, what is right in your home, what is right in your church, you'll find yourself having a much more upbeat attitude and you'll be a much happier person. You see, it's just a matter so often of how we choose to look at things. Norman Vincent Peale is commonly known as the father of positive thinking. But the Apostle Paul perhaps wrote the first book on positive thinking many, many years before. Paul wrote, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. The Apostle Paul didn't just talk about positive thinking in theory. We realize that the Apostle Paul demonstrated it in his own life. In Philippians 1.12, Paul gives three areas of his life where he could have been extremely negative. He encountered circumstances and people and a future that could have really soured him and his outlook. But he turned every single one of them into a positive. And Paul was not successful um, because he closed his eyes to reality and pretended that everything was always wonderful. Paul did evaluate his life realistically. He didn't have some kind of a Pollyanna outlook on life. He looked at things realistically. 
but, but he chose a positive response because of his faith in God. And we can do the same in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic and in the midst of everything else that life is going to continue to bring our way as we continue to move on the rest of our life. So how can we realistically choose to be positive in the midst of hard times? What can we learn from Paul's example? Well, the first thing as we look at our text tonight is that Paul turned his unpleasant circumstances into a positive witness for Jesus Christ. Let's look first of all at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. And Paul writes there, And I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Acts chapter 21 through 28 details some horrible things that happened to Paul. He had been attacked by a vicious mob in Jerusalem who thought he had brought a Gentile into the Jewish temple area and they had nearly killed him. Then he was mistakenly identified by the Roman soldiers who thought that he was an Egyptian rebel who was on their most wanted list. And they had arrested him. The Jews then set up a plan to kill Paul in prison. And when the plan was discovered, Paul was quickly by night escorted to Caesarea by 270 Roman soldiers. When he arrived in Caesarea and was brought before the authorities, their false witnesses lied about him. And the Jews, Roman political leaders, and Paul engaged in several rounds of verbal tug-of-war. He remained a prisoner in Caesarea for two years. Finally, Paul appealed to Caesar as a Roman citizen, and he set sail for the city of Rome. On the trip across the Mediterranean Sea, the ship encountered a horrendous storm that lasted for two weeks. They finally shipwrecked. The passenger and all the crew survived on the island of Malta for three months. And finally, Paul came to Rome, there to wait for a trial before Caesar. Paul remained in Rome for two years, under house arrest, and chained to a Roman soldier 24-7. As we said Sunday, under strict shelter-in-place orders. But Paul said what had happened to him, again looking at verse 12, what had happened to him had actually served to advance the gospel. The word advance commonly described the removing of obstacles so that an army could go forward as quickly and easily as possible. And Paul saw himself as paving the way for Christians that would follow him and continue the work of the kingdom after he had departed the scene. Paul goes on to give two positive results for his being in chains, for being a prisoner. Warren Wearsby said, The same God who used Moses' rod, Gideon's pitchers, and David's sling used Paul's chains. In verse 13, he talks about Roman soldiers who were hearing the gospel for the first time. He said, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. He was in chains for Christ. 24 hours a day, every day, Paul was chained to a Roman soldier. They were chained to him in six-hour shifts. And so that means that four different soldiers each day would be chained to the Apostle Paul. But instead of seeing the soldier on duty next to him as some sort of a 
horrible restriction on his freedom, Paul saw it as the, for the advancement of the gospel. Paul saw the soldier next to him as a captive audience for whatever he was doing, saying, or involved in. And Paul, like the other Roman soldiers, wasn't telling the latest dirty jokes or retelling their drinking exploits of the previous day. He was talking to people about Jesus Christ. He was asking them about their spiritual condition. He was praying for them. He was writing letters to individuals and churches. Throughout his day, he was constantly, in some form, giving his life and his time and his efforts to the advancement of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. These soldiers learned who Jesus was. And perhaps some of them told Paul sometimes just to shut up. There were others who directly or indirectly listened to Paul. And some of them were converted to Christ. And when they left that place, in freedom, they took the gospel of Christ where they happened to be. They told their friends, they told their families what they had learned from Paul. And they were taking the message, some of them, right up to Caesar's doorstep. Later in the book of Philippians, the fourth chapter in the 22nd verse, again writing from a prison in Rome, Paul wrote these words, he said, all God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Some of Caesar's own family had been converted to Jesus Christ. The word through the soldiers, through others, had reached into Caesar's household and brought converts to Christ. Caesar was indeed a very, very powerful man in that day and time. But he couldn't prevent the soldiers from bringing the gospel right into his own household. The second positive result of Paul being in chains was that Christians were encouraged. Let's look at verse 14 of Philippians 1. <clears throat> Paul says, Because of my chains... Most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of, the, of God more courageously and fearlessly. The word proclaim here in verse 14 doesn't mean to preach. It means everyday conversation. You know, Paul's trial was probably the hot topic in daily conversations of that time. It's kind of like the coronavirus for us today. I mean, you, if you turn on your TV or your radio or open the newspaper or you look at your, your phone for the news blasts that are there or your tablet, I mean, most all of it's about some aspect of the coronavirus. And as that is our hot button topic today for, for those living in Paul's time and when he was a prisoner in Rome and, and, and you know, he was the, he was the topic. He was what everyone was discussing. And Paul's persecution gave the Christians the opportunity to talk about their faith in Christ. As people say, oh, did you hear about Paul? And what, what, this is what Paul did, and this is what Paul said. And, and Christians would be encouraged by that, and they'd say, hey, that, that Jesus Christ is my Savior too. Let me tell you what he means in my life. You see, Paul's courage gave the Christians more boldness because they were inspired by his example. Again, Warren Wiersbe wrote, Paul's secret was he looked upon his circumstances as God-given opportunities for the furtherance of the gospel, and he rejoiced at what God was going to do instead of complaining about what God did not do. You see, what Paul exhibits for us here can be a life-changing attitude choice. When difficult circumstances come to your life, instead of asking, why did God allow this to happen to me? We ask, how can this result 
in the advancing of the gospel. And maybe that's not a question that you're used to asking, but it's a question you can begin to ask. And instead of complaining about why this is happening to you, to me, we can begin saying, what does God want to do through this to advance the kingdom work, to advance the gospel, and begin living out what we believe that to be? Paul said, I want you to know that those difficult things that happened to me have served to advance the gospel in my life and in the lives of others. Another area that could have soured Paul was that he dealt with very unreasonable people, but he chose to focus on the positives of their ministry. Let's look again uh, down at our Bibles. Look at verses 15 and 16. He said, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. <clears throat> People who were envious, as they are described here by Paul, certainly weren't envious of Paul's hardships, of Paul's sacrifices, but they were certainly envious of his influence with Christians. They got tired of hearing Christians talk about how great Paul was. And so apparently, they were preaching the gospel, but they were preaching it to compete with Paul and to draw favorable attention to themselves. They sought to belittle Paul in their sermons. Maybe they jokingly referred to him as, as that jailbird or some other derogatory terminology that they would think of, that they would use periodically in their sermons to, to, to push him down and elevate themselves. You know, there are strange people in the world who think that they look bigger if they can tear down a leader or they can tear down any other person that they envy and bring that person down to their level. Look at verse 17. Paul says, The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. It's important to understand that we look at this text and what's going on be, in, behind this text is that these people hadn't changed the gospel as had been done uh, to those that were he addressed in the letter to the Galatians. People that had added Jewish faith items that you had to, had to be circumcised to be a follower of Christ and they hadn't changed the gospel. These people hadn't changed the gospel. If they had changed the gospel like in the book of Galatians, they would have been rebuked. But instead, they had chose to cut on Paul, to try to hurt his reputation, to try to make him look like a smaller, less significant man than others were. And Paul said for those people, you simply need to ignore them. And although these people made life unpleasant for Paul, I'm sure he didn't enjoy hearing about these things, Paul chose to focus on the positive aspect of their ministries. Let's look at verse 18. <clears throat> Paul said, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. You know, God still speaks through imperfect people because that's the only kind he has. And the message of the gospel is so powerful that it comes through the most corrupt channels. When you encounter unreasonable people who make false accusations against you, don't retaliate. Don't get into a, a cut down uh, dialogue with them, trying to top each other and slamming each other verbally. Don't focus on the negative and find yourself down on their level. You're going to want to. That's human nature. 
but don't do it. Paul said, ignore those people. Paul said Christ was being preached. That these people were doing some good, and that's what's important. So, really, what does it matter? You know, Paul was such an amazing man. He handled difficult people with grace and kindness and a positive spirit. And he could do so because his ego was completely out of it. One thing mattered to Paul more than anything else, and that is that Jesus Christ was preached, that Jesus Christ was exalted, even if that meant that he had to deal with unpleasant circumstances and unreasonable people, it was okay with him because Jesus Christ was lifted up. The third thing that could have soured Paul was a very uncertain future. But he chose to focus on his positive eternity. Let's look at the last part of verse 18 and verse 19. Paul said, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that though for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. <clears throat> Paul was on trial because he was a Roman citizen, a Roman citizen that had a higher authority than Caesar. He was considered by Rome an enemy of the state. A guilty verdict would result in his execution. And Christianity was still not well understood in Rome. And so the outcome of a trial, when it came, was, was, was very uncertain to Paul or anybody else at that particular time. So he goes on to say in verse 20, he said, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul understood and knew quite well that he was a flaw of human being. And he said, I just pray that when I'm called upon, I will in no way embarrass my Lord Jesus Christ. That when I get on the witness stand, and that pressure is on that I'll have the boldness to say what needs to be said about the gospel, about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The next verse that is here is a very familiar one to us, one and all. Verse 21, Paul said, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul said, if I keep on living, I'm going to be able to advance the cause of Christ. But if I die, that's to my gain as well, because I get to go to heaven. And so in Paul's mind, as he thought about his life and his uncertain future, was it was a win-win situation for him. I love how uh, the Living Bible um, has the same verse, verse 21. The Living Bible says, for to me, living means opportunities for Christ. And dying? Well, that's better yet. You see, instead of focusing on the negative, I could die. Paul focused on the positive. To die is to go to heaven and be with Christ and to get a new body. And that is better by far than living. Let's look at verses 22 and following. <clears throat> Paul said, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain 
and I will continue with all of you for your progress and join the faith so that through my being with you again your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Paul said if I live the kingdom is going to continue to advance through me. And for those that he was writing to that he would be able to continue to to write to them and encourage them and teach them and many others. And so he realized that him staying would certainly advance the gospel. But he knew to die and go to heaven is great gain too. And that is the promise that is available to the Christian. And it's this verse that has helped a lot of us survive the death of our, our family and our friends in Christ. We survive funerals because of a verse like this in the Bible. Because it reminds us that there is often things to be gained here, but the greatest gain is, is what is yet to come in heaven. I'm wondering as we look at this text today, is there uncertainty knocking on the door of your life? Are you in treatment perhaps for a terminal illness? Have you been laid off from your job? Do you wonder if your business is going to survive the, the closures related to the coronavirus? Do you wonder if your retirement is still going to be there when all of this reaches its conclusion? Do you have a child or a grandchild in an unsafe situation? Do you wonder if someone around you is a carrier of the coronavirus that's going to give it to you or your children or your aged parent. You know, God certainly wants us to trust Him and His promises during this time of uncertainty and certainly during any anything that will come in our lives in the future. Remember that whatever you have to endure, God will be with you through it. He will provide whatever resource you need to meet your uncertainty. I like the words of 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that said, And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. God knows what we can handle. God knows what we need, truly need. In our times of uncertainty, in our times of loss, God knows. And He will provide what we need. I like the verse that we talked about this past Sunday from Psalm 46 1. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. Always ready to help in times of trouble. He will help us face whatever comes. So whatever you face out there, be positive about it. The Lord is going to strengthen you through it. And with the right choice, it can be used to further the gospel, to exalt the name of Christ, to give a positive testimony for Him and what He can mean for life in any situation. The Lord is going to strengthen you through it. And for the Christian, it's always good to remember that life on this earth is temporary, but we have the hope of eternity. You see, on the other side of the door of death for us is Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5, these verses, he said, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. 
For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we'll be, we will be at home with the Lord. Paul said to die in Christ is gain. He said to depart and be with the Lord is far better. So instead of focusing on our uncertainties and our fears, let's focus on the positive of his presence now and into eternity. It makes all the difference in the world. Would you pray with me? Father, we continue to thank you for your power, seen, felt, through, through your word. And Father, we know that that same word changed our lives and continues to change lives around this world. And we know, Father, that your word spoken into our lives in any situation is the word of authority, of grace, of mercy, of the truth that we need to hear. Sometimes we get so caught up in what is going on around us that we can easily lose our perspective and our grasp of your hand. And I just pray that you would continue to speak into our hearts and lives that we would open ourselves to you, open ourselves to your word. Not only that your word will help and minister to us, but we will be able to use you and your word to minister and help others. Thank you so much for this church family. For the fact that we pray for each other and lift up each other, but we also pray and help our neighbor. Because Father, everyone needs Jesus. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. I look forward to seeing you the next time.